All right, so this is a kind of a technical journal entry, but it was never just technical. Enjoyable, and the fact that it's enjoyable will be not just where we started, but where we'll end. As I begin by saying that I entered this small forest here with some particular complaints, uh, some of which do with just a recent random encounter with a mentally ill person that disturbed me. And the reflection upon which has often on lasted a few days, and you never quite know how deep something's going to go. And uh, learning to exercise more patience, I understand a lot of people, even however violently disposed they are, by the time they sort of lose it with little to no provocation, they've essentially um, exhausted all of their patience in life. And uh, so I want to have compassion for that. So then it's time to, you know, give away some of your patience, even though you didn't really want to. <laughs> and you resent it a little bit. And I think sometimes I think I get bothered by violence because I resent having to give people my patience because I feel it's been tried, you know, throughout my entire life. And I think it, my, my opinion is fair, my objection is fair. But I think as I've taken narcissists out of my life, in a sense, I'm not using my patience in that way. So I should have a little bit to spare for the average mentally ill person. <laughs> and we're all kind of mentally ill in a way. I entered this uh, grove with, you know, other things on my heart. I won't go into all of them. We all know what's on our hearts. And uh, <clears throat> very few of us need to have anyone remind us, I suppose, <laughs> when our hearts are open. And maybe even if they're disturbed, because it does quite often force them open. <laughs> Um, I'm glad that I'm a time in my life, by the way, but my, can, my heart is vulnerable enough to be as open as it is, even though a lot of my heart's CPU time tends to go feeling sad and hurt. It's just, it's like, I can see why I don't use this that often. It's, uh, it's a very difficult world to go with through your heart, um, to experience in your heart. And uh, because I've given voice to so many things, I think it's allowed me to feel things a little bit more in my heart. I mean, I've given my life to the way I talk and think, and whatever you may think about it, uh, I think that's a significant uh, commitment. Um, and I have to live with that. And as I, I come into this fairy grove and I detect the fair, blue fairy mist as I come in here, and, um, I don't mean any disrespect to this forest. It's a... Uh, it's not a force that would stand out completely right away to a lot of people, right? And in a way, I feel the same way, so we're in good company. And uh, it's still a disrespectful thing to say with the forest right here. As are, but, you know, nature is actually quite patient and forgiving. You'll notice that, again, the cows continue to give their meat. The cow people, our ancestors, no matter how badly we treat them, and even, you know, and, and, uh, and, and so on and so on. So our sickness is met with a lot of patience on the part of the earth. That's a lot of love, basically. And I don't put that in any specific terms because I think the term is greatly misused. But I think we're all, um, we all, um, well advised, and I think we're all permitted and should be permitted to have something to say about what love is, and um, that a good evidence of love is the animals giving us their meat under the worst of circumstances much as I think people give of themselves to the system under fairly bad circumstances, whether we die from them right away or not, and uh, which do choke a lot of life out of man, in my, in my view. Uh, but I'm prepared to change my view over time as I can find more things to be confident in, uh, maybe to increase my powers of observation and my fairness of mind for the great contributions that people do make throughout their lives, if, if what I say has any truth to it at all, that uh, we give our lives to the earth, and who are we to judge what other people are giving, ultimately, and perhaps I will get as much respect as I offer others, and if nothing else, I suppose, set a good example along the way for my children, if nothing else. I, I do sense recently that I do have things that I could grow, I could increase my patience, my, and also understand that I don't have to give it so much to people in my life who aren't worth my time. Um, sounds a little maudlin as I say it, but it's, it's a, there's an enormous amount of growth in some of the more maudlin descriptions and even patterns, repetitive patterns of our lives that, like this forest, for instance, might not stand out at first, but I've walked here over many years, and it's distinctive in that um, it's not as overgrown as the areas around it. It's set apart 
physically. So if you start with um, a whimsical perception of fairy, blue fairy mist, you'll notice if you look closely at the bark, well, you can't look closely, you're not afforded the opportunity, but uh, the bark has an off blue tint to it. You might start with gray if you feel more comfortable in the visual spectrum because there's a certain thresholds where what we call things and what we see start to have um, interaction with each other. They start to validate or invalidate each other. And then the mind can become split and say, oh no, it's gray. I don't see the blue in that. <laughs> right. Um, and then the blue in this particular case and a little bit beyond the blue spec spectrum of the solar plexus. <coughs> a little bit beyond the blue. And uh, I wanted to give note that I'd uh, entered this place with that understanding and sat down here with that understanding and had some very beautiful reflections, uh, among which included the uh, appreciation in more detail with the type of attributes that this place actually has, watching the swaying of trees and enjoying the vast expanse of blue that it affords me with a beautiful boundary of young trees, all of whom have responded to the catastrophic treatment that man has forced this place to endure. Man who also gives his life to the earth and we should think about making better use of it, I think, if everyone's giving giving their life to the earth, we should respect them more and have more patience and we should make sure that they don't have to work any harder than they already do. You know, and I try when I encounter any profession, none of which I completely like because it's all part of a religion and everything on TV is a religion and so forth. But, you know, is to not make anyone's day any harder than it already is. You know, uh, you know, some workers, you know, city workers and stuff, depending on what family they grow up in, sometimes don't take a kind view to long-haired hippies walking around. But, you know, I never, I always have the utmost respect for them because, um, you know, I don't want to make their days any harder than they are. At the end of the day, that's all that really matters to me. You know, I don't think, I don't want to go through this world and make it any harder for anyone than it may already be. By the way, nothing, something that I will never be perfect at. It's unavoidable. And so, you know, life isn't always easy platitudes like love your neighbor. We're not going to be able to love everyone. There are people who are going to hate us. We're going to meet each other at the wrong time in the wrong place, and maybe both of us have ran out of our patience that day, and all millions of other fucking reasons why people get on each other's nerves. And then you can get into the more pathological nature. Yes, there are many people who are quite uh, evidently, if not intentionally, ill-disposed toward their fellow man, or girls, or women, or young boys, or uh, brown people, or blue people, and you name it. People who think this way, people who think that way. I'm not looking for reasons to be discourteous to people. Sometimes just vocalizing my opinion, I think, disturbs people around me. My irreverence for society and so forth. All of which demands, to be fair, probably a good deal of acquaintance with my work, if you're even going to come close to understanding it. As self-evident as it may be across every scale of measure in the world. And precisely because of which, um, it is very difficult for people to understand because they spend most of their time subsequently just punching it and stamping it into the skin of their fellow man like a fucking tattoo that just won't go away. Made by man's avarice to man under circumstances as yet unknown. An unidentified self-fucking object. It just landed in our lives a few tens of thousands of years ago. <clears throat> Boy, do we love slavery. And slavery loves us. That should be on the cover of the last 30,000 years of anthropology. Boy, we love slavery, and slavery sure loves, sure done love us. <laughs> Signed, man. <laughs> and in this book is contained some of the events of a sentient creature who is able to construct such an ironic simile of his existence. So begin the various textbooks of the 23rd century. It's really a good example, and perhaps a very satirical one, about how knowledge takes the shape of how we couch it. And just like our perception can take the frame of what we're willing to consider about the color spectrum or the enchantment of this place, which I have entered in many of the specs which I have recounted, and sat here and smoked some more marijuana and watched the swaying of trees, and became quite occupied with actually watching them and started to realize that they might have something to teach me about swaying, and that life does throw all kinds of shit our way, and at the very least, at least, it strengthens our roots. And then I started moving my body because I wondered to myself, how could that, even that sort of blithesome message, be of any real substantive use to anybody? What, what kind of philosophy would you place that in? 
And then I just began to move and just a couple of logs and I sort of lay on top of them and started stretching and doing leg lifts and what have you and feeling my body and I really needed to. And it created all kinds of good circulations and pleasure running through my body and I got up and I just walked around and sure enough I was like, oh, I feel a good deal better. I feel more enchanted and alive. And uh, I think I'm going to make a video about that. And so that is why the last 11 minutes of your life happened. That's the story of the conception of this special little time you've had, little one. And now I'm going to touch you in your special place. I always find a way to ruin things. That's a bad habit of mine. Sometimes it's nice not to be so serious anymore. I have to, I do, I have to shock myself a little bit out of being so serious. I am a very serious man. And uh, I think probably one of the things most people have noticed about me, if somebody asks me what is something that people notice about you, he's like, he's got a fucking serious look on his face. Probably don't fuck with him. That's an intense dude. And then other people, people that I generally like more and who probably tend to like me more, are people who kind of see like behind that seriousness is a certain amount of mirth, a certain amount of irony. A certain amount of yeah, I, I have a little acquaintance with the uh, what this world calls charming and civilized, and uh, around various fucking tables around the world and bars and altars and water coolers around the world, people basically widely admit this fact. <laughs> they do. It, it's the source of our comedy, our humor, our religion, our faith, our hope. We we love it all. We wrap ourselves in the flag of civilization and all that we can make of it. You know, be the best that you can be, you know, in the army of the world. Keep marching on. And in the book of anthropology, I suggested you could, you could look at these listed under a, a category called the slogans that were typical. What could be deduced about the types of phrases whose sequence of letters people were disposed to feel a very heartening and deeply ingrained truth of their lives, such as be all you can be. They could go through, peel through the advertising, peel through the religion, right? Leave less of a carbon footprint. Boom, 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 and it all would go down. You could analyze it that way. In a context, does that make it wrong or stupid? No, it's sort of a context, isn't it? It's how people talk. Why did they talk that way? What does that say about them? And if it's unflattering, what is illuminating about them? because that's, that can also reflect upon their great genius. Right? And what is, what is actually incredibly intelligent about what man, what man did to man based on the context of millions or hundreds of thousands of years of our existence. Okay, so there's intelligence in that too. And that also speaks of the genius of man. And in this way we can massage a philosophy that allows us to enjoy how the world has forced us to flex our roots, having almost a forensic acknowledgement of just how barbaric that has actually been for most of us, and then kind of massage it into something that has, if it's as, as mighty as it, I guess it is, how life is and how people have said life had to be for hundreds of thousands of years, could it also be therapeutic? Could it be illuminating in a therapeutic sense? Are we do we have license? Should we permit each other? In what circumstances would it be permitted to exercise some creative license in the colors and hues of our history so that we could flex our roots even more? So that as strong as they are, they could just all work together a bit better at the root level. And this is what you would call like mass magic or mass ritual. Maybe what some people would call a black mass. I just, I would just call it just a collecting of energy. <laughs> and allowing it to achieve uh, what it needs to achieve in order to move and be st as strong as it needs to be. And certainly for me at a therapeutic level. And I'm interacting with the whole planet. You know, these special little sacred, you know, people walk through them. One man has walked by. And uh, very pleasant. It's a nice, pleasant encounter. There are really cool people out here too, and I'm being reminded of why I like this area. That's another reason I'm making these videos, to remind myself why I like Nanus. The things it offers those who have a keen eye and a soft heart. And my grandfather has already come to me today, and we've had a good talk, and I've learned things, things that I'll take away from that, as I'm learning from the trees. And uh, the little bit of exercise and the making of meaning that has allowed me to play and 
permitted me to play with the threshold between what I call things with words and what I see with my eyes. And what I can see with my eyes when I, I'm at liberty with my words. And how with seeing with my eyes I can be at more liberty with how I use my mind. And, and something's been achieved in that. <clears throat> this video gives evidence of it. It's scientific in the most honest sense of being psychological. You have entered the magic zone. Yeah, my mind uh, gets really stirred up when I get going poetically and the like. I'm ultimately uh, moved in as much as I might offer any instruction or explanation by a strong urge to journal that possessed me when I was about 18 years old. That was it. I mean, it it marked a change in my life. Um, but I, I, maybe there were people I wouldn't have to explain how it was pretty imperative change in my life. Maybe kids out there who do art or just you know, like to draw. Or, God, I mean, it's it's just such a gift. You know, if you have any artistic gift at all or any artistic at all, which I think everybody does something that you can do by yourself, it's just for you, maybe something only you will read or see. I've never been able to really tell people about that. People I meet in my life, even if they take an interest in the fact that I write anything at all, which is very unusual, it's sort of like a holy day. If it ever happens, I know that that's one of the most holy days of the year. It's great, you know, and I live on a little bit, and I have a little bit of relationship and a little bit of this, which means every one of my decisions means more. But living that way focuses my mind. And it's also a way that maybe I was just forced to live, or maybe I'm a stupid person, or of a low social IQ. I think it'd be interesting to look at people who are socially isolated, who have higher than average IQs. I don't like the term IQ, but that's, I don't want to have to fucking qualify myself every time I use it. Obviously, I'm a fairly intelligent man. Intelligent enough that I have very little fucking control of anything. And I'm fucking lucky for what little control I might have on a daily basis in health because I've also had great physical pain in my life and that creates a certain kind of person, a kind of person who's felt a lot of fucking physical pain on top of years and years of psychological pain as it moves through the system. And I don't have a fucking choice. I have to learn to accommodate pain and most of it that of other people in their unmitigated aggression. And now in my life I'm starting to feel it in my heart more. <laughs> And uh, then it starts a kind of new stage of my life. And uh, I do have some say in how I talk about it. And I feel like I have a lot of liberty in, in how I talk about my life and what kind of person I am. Um, maybe some people can relate to being in high school and going to a new school or something or moving to a new city and thinking, hey, I can be who I want to be now or I can be this person. Not quite the same because I'm not looking into constructing some stupid personality uh, or profession for myself. I don't have a profession, and I never want to have a profession. Like, if any time I ever fucking get to be nearly professional, you can fucking cut my, cut my fucking balls off and, you know, put them in somebody's golf cart, preferably somebody famous, who put them in their mouth and suck on them like rock candy. Mmm, salty. <laughs> uh, yeah, there is no sufficient punishment for being a professional and joining professions. I'm sorry, I've been very charitable today, and I think I do have a, a temper on me. And I just, sometimes I get tired of explaining it and talking about it and studying it. And it's perfectly selfish and probably infantile for me to say, but I just fish that people would just fucking be more smart. I know that sound, doesn't even sound like a complete English sentence, but be more smart. Be more smart, fellow apes. Be more smart, you know. Be better at, at taking the ticks off each other's mental backs. <laughs> You know, while you're grooming each other's mock mockeries of personalities. You know, take a few more of those ticks off the back before you eat your bananas and go to sleep. Not noticing the little fucking uh, tic-tac-toe of, of various pharmaceutical drugs that are stuck in your banana. <laughs> With a little bowl that says suppository on it which is like the Vaseline you have to put up your ass so you can put through another day of having the pitchfork of civilization stuck in and out of your arsehole. <laughs> Sorry. 
when I get when I get uncharitable and infantile, it, it makes me laugh. You see, you need a little bit of the ridiculous, you see, just to keep the energy flowing. I mean, it is fucking ridiculous. And everyone in the world, I mean, you could use my video and you could mock that. I mean, let it be used for something. Hell, even the Bible can be used as toilet paper. I dare say the contents is vastly improved from the experience. The procedure, I should say. Some of which I did today. Not everyone can say that they wiped their ass with pages from the Holy Bible today. What a beautiful day it was, as he recounted in his memoirs. I had only just wiped my ass with the pages of St. Paul the Apostle, when it occurred to me that fairies were actually true. Something about wiping away the offending material <laughs> improved the quality of my mind. It was hard to tell people at first. I thought that they might think me rude or even sick or crazy. But then I stood amongst an enchanted grove of trees and thought, what the fuck are you waiting for? <laughs> you think they're just going to stop asking people for taxes? <laughs> Start using your mind. Get out of the zoo. Set your own rules. You can complain about a lot of things, but if you don't use the freedom you have, you don't fucking deserve it. And if my freedom in life came from journaling, just looking at the time on my camera. So journaling a lot, and that's it. I became a talker to no one in particular. I certainly wasn't writing to God. God came and went in one week when I was about nine or ten. That was all that God played a role in my life because there just didn't seem to be a lot of room in a, any kind of logical world. And someone who doesn't fit in a logical world and claims to be the creator of it, um, you know, doesn't fit anywhere really except as sort of like the first thing that stares you at the back of your skull when you see a nuclear explosion from like a hundred feet away. God is the result of a penetrating level of coordinated psychosis spread over tens of thousands of years. A delusion doesn't go far enough and Richard Dawkins is certainly not far away from the explosion enough to tell us anything actual about the last hundred years let alone the last hundred billion. So, I guess you could say, I have a different standard for intelligence than most people. And that's about as rewarding and distinctive a quality about me as, I don't know what, the color of my eyes, as far as the rest of the world is concerned. Some people might like them and some people might not. But like this forest, one thing's for certain, they're blue. <laughs>